Welcome fathers who are looking to inspire their kids and become fearless. This is the Become a Fearless Father show and I'm your host, Klaas van Oosterhout. I'm a father of two boys, husband and entrepreneur. This show is created to teach you how to take control and enjoy the most difficult job you've ever faced, fatherhood. I'm going to keep it real and share real life experience. A heads up, there is no magic pill. You will have to put in the hours, sweat and tears to achieve victory. Are you ready to improve your health, wealth, relationships, knowledge and become the hero your family needs you to be? I know you are. So get your pen and paper ready and let's become fearless fathers together. Great. So Larry, great. Awesome you're here. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, before uh, I get to the usual first question of introducing you. <laughs> I want to tell you a funny story. Um, you got a lot of kids, so I bet you you, uh, <laughs> you got in a similar situation. Um, as you know, that these are my first interviews, right? So um, I'm a bit nervous, of course. <laughs> and uh, in this case, um, I I'm really excited because, you know, Niji and Niji at the moment uh, is my, uh, he's my mentor. Um, and he, he talks really highly of you, so I, I, <laughs> I was really excited when you said yes. So the whole day I was a little nervous and you're preparing myself and um, my wife is supposed to be home. She's not. I, I put the kids at, uh, at, at watching TV and I hope everything goes okay. But at 6.30, so 30 minutes ago, <laughs> my two-year-old who just got off diapers made the biggest crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right in my office nice oh smells good in there i bet right no and it's hot <laughs> it's like 35 degrees here in celsius i don't know how much that is in far i'm sorry but that's hot so i'm sweating i can't open the window because of the noise so <laughs> nice of course i had to stress and work real quick trying to clean him so my nerves are gone <laughs> So you got to look at the positive, right? That's right. So, yeah, I thought I'd start off with that story. I found it hilarious. Um, things like that, I guess. It's a perfect dad story, man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so great. So, Larry, again, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, you bet. You bet, I, man. Um, let, let's, let's start off with, uh, with introducing you. Tell us your story. Who are you? Where are you from? Uh, yeah, well, what's 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 all behind Larry that that got you all the way up until uh, tell you where you are at now? Wow, man! So yeah, I'll make this I'll make this quick. Uh, I so I I have, I'm a dad of four boys. I have a 12 year old, 10 year old, four year old, two year old. I just found one of them in the cabinet, which was wow. kind of funny. Uh, the, the four year old we couldn't find him anywhere. He was all curled up in a, in a cabinet in the kitchen, which is kind of funny. So we, we have a very busy house. I've been married to the same woman. It'll be 15 years in a month here. So, um, you know, definitely enjoying, uh, my, well, my wife marriage. I mean, we, we've got a really good relationship. We, we really like it. We really love each other a lot. Uh, my, my story, I grew up in without going into too much detail, uh, cause I don't want to meander on for too long. I want to get to, I want to get to your questions and make this as impactful for you and your, your audience as possible. But I grew up in a fatherless environment for half my childhood. And then the other half, I grew up with a pretty toxic environment when it came to fatherhood. So my mom was married three times. She dated men in between each marriage. Uh, and all of them just sort of had like a bit of a, a bit of toxicity or addiction issues that came along with it. So whether it was alcohol or drugs or that kind of thing. And uh, most of them were not too nice either. You know, pretty, pretty mentally uh, abusive, physically abusive, all that good stuff. So you know, half my childhood was spent without one. The other half was spent with that type of role model. And it wasn't, it wasn't really pleasant. So I always said to myself, I was like, you know, I am not going to do this when I'm a father myself. And, you know, I, I was a dad for about six years at the time. I had two, just two boys, six and four, and I wasn't beating them and I wasn't being abusive and I wasn't that guy, but I, I wasn't there. And I just wasn't, I wasn't present. I wasn't intentional. I wasn't purposeful. And I was, I was just, I kind of did the whole dad thing from like an arm's length, you know, and I just hit real, a real low point with it. Cause I was my own worst critic. Like a lot of, like a lot of other men were. 
And I just decided at, at a low point, I was like, I got to do something different. You know, and I've been in sales all my life and there's tons of courses out there and tons of books to read, you know, on how to be a better salesperson, how to interact with people better, social dynamics and sales processes and all like it's endless, right? You can, and that comes with any industry. You know, if you want to go in IT, you can have all the, all the training that you want. If you want to go in the health industry, you can have all kinds of training. But when you become a father, it's almost like you're sent home with this kid and they're like, Hey, best of luck. Hope it works out. So they're not to say that there aren't parenting books out there, but there are, but I just wanted something different. You know, I want it to be, I want it to be more than just a parent. I was like, I can't be a good parent unless I'm the best me. Like it's, it's impossible for me to be a good parent, a good father, unless I am the best me I can be. So I started, I created a Facebook page in 2012. And I just said to you know, I just was like, yeah, I'm just going to go out and learn something every, every day. I'm just going to learn something new every day. And I just surrendered my ego and all of us, by the way, if you're a man listening to this or a woman, all of us have egos to some degree. You know, a lot of people hear the word ego. They think of this giant overconfident person who puts everybody else down. Now, ego, it can show up, you know, in several different forms. Ego can even show up as I can't ask for help. You know, I can't that, because that look, that makes me look weak. That's our ego talking. I was the same way. And most men are the same way. Don't want to ask for help. So I just started, I just surrendered that ego. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to be, I'm going to be a student of this. I'm going to be a student of fatherhood and just maybe it'll inspire somebody else. And if I'm doing it publicly, that that will keep me accountable to keep doing it. So I noticed that the page got some traction. And then in 2013, a year later, I started a blog and I really didn't enjoy writing too much, even though I'm, I'm a published author, but I didn't enjoy writing a whole lot. So I, I was like, I really like speaking. You know, I really like it. It's, sort of that's my comfort zone. So I started a podcast in 2015. At the time, it was the Good Dad Project podcast. And that's what I've been doing for the past three years. Uh, podcast has grown to over 180 countries. It's the number one dad podcast on iTunes. I mean, I, I, I say that very humbly because I'm like, who, who in God's name would follow like a total moron like me who's screwing up every day as a father? But um, that's what the podcast has really become is it's, I, I always say that I'm a student and a podcast is, is my learning. And I get to speak to people who are a heck of a lot smarter than me every single week. And the audience just gets to learn right along with me, which is kind of fun. And then in 2016, we started what's called the dad edge masterminds, which we get like-minded men together in groups of 10. And we help men become better fathers, better husbands, better for ourselves, better providers, better with our health, mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, but doing work that, that makes us come alive, you know, not just the grind of nine to five where we hate what we do. So we, you know, we, we I did that in 2016, then 2017 uh, developed uh, an, a community called the Dad Edge Alliance, which is now our, it's our huge mastermind community. We have about 250 men who are a part of it and it is just growing and it's the men in there are thriving and everyone is becoming more empowered because of the tribe and the men that we surround ourselves with. And it's been just a, it's been an unbelievable journey and it's definitely helped me be a better father to my kids. Cause I, at this point, to be honest with you, I would probably be divorced. I'd probably be an alcoholic. I'd probably just be a complete and total disaster if it wasn't for this mission in this community. And I say that not because of me, but because of the, the men I've gotten, I've, I've been able to meet through the podcast, through the community, the guests that we've had on the show. It's like, you know, when you can have conversations with these people and then continue that relationship, you know, past the podcast interview, it just becomes like, just, it just becomes a community that just thrives. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's awesome. Um, I was actually going to say, um, because this is all, this, this part is new for me. Um, I read your book twice <laughs> already. <laughs> um, so, um, so you were the one. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually kind of feel like I know you already. Um, so yeah, your, your story is very interesting, very, uh, very rough. And I recommend everybody to read it to see where you came from and where you're at now. It's absolutely amazing to me. And I, I got tons of questions. I, I told you in the email, uh, I, got, I think I got so many questions. We can fill up four interviews. <laughs> but I took the ones that I think are most pressing, both to me and, and, and other fathers out there. So um Let's uh, let, let's dive right in. I'm going to do a little mix between things that I read in your book and other things that I 
just came up with and then things that I struggle with at the moment that that might be things that that you already heard from other fathers and, and hopefully you have a, a really awesome solution a really simple solution which I like <laughs> I, I can't promise the simple solution, but I can yeah. probably promise you that I've heard it before. So, and, and I can, I can at least share with you what other, what other people have done to be successful and what other people have shared in that situation to be successful. So I, yeah, I think, I, th- I think to date, if you could, if you can think of it, I've heard it. I, I I've, I have heard some just unbelievable stories. Excellent. Well, um, that, that, that's great and then let's see how far we can uh, can get of course um so yeah um in your book uh, you begin sharing about uh, your challenging childhood um, and now you mentioned just now that, that you got four kids so of course um everybody can understand that um you know you would be too afraid to be a father um, at all you know with everything that's happened to you Nevertheless, you not only became a father, uh, you started your own project, like you just explained to us, helping other fathers. So how, how did you make it? What, was, what, what did you do um, to, to, to become from, from that low point and, and to this, um, this high point? And, and, and especially looking at mindset and, and, and that aspect of, of being a, a, a father, being a man. That's a good question. Every man that I've ever come across, me included, reaches a point where they've had enough. They, they've had enough of something in their life, whether that's maybe it's their financial situation where they're like, I've had enough. I'm, I'm ready to pay down this debt. Or maybe it's their health where they reach a certain weight and body fat percentage and they're like, I've had enough. I'm, I'm ready to, to do something different. I'm ready to hire that trainer. I'm ready to eat, start eating right. Uh, same thing with our relationships. You know, when we when we're in a really rough marriage, uh, we reach a point where like I've had enough. You know, either we work this out or we we separate. One of the two. My journey as a father, it just got to that point where I'd had enough. I'd had enough of feeling not up to the task. I had enough of feeling basically having zero confidence with it whatsoever. Uh, I got tired of trying to guess my way through it. And I got tired of not being the husband that I know that I could be for my wife because my wife's an amazing woman. So I just, I'd had enough. And I think when you've had enough, that's when you, you sidestep your ego. And that's when you say, okay, let's show me the way, like I'm done. Like, just show me how to do this. And that's what I did. I, I just, I sought out mentors. I, you know, I started my blog. I sought out mentors. I, I invested in coaching. I invested in masterminds. I invested in books. I uh, had better conversations with people. So instead of talking about the same typical things that we men talk about, which is the weather and, you know, sports and what we did on the weekend and work and everything is good and everything is fine and fine and good. I started having different conversations with people. And most importantly, I learned how to build a band of brothers. And what I mean by that is that's, that's a skill that has been lost uh, over the past probably five decades. Uh, with, with the introduction of social media, text messaging, and all the, a lot of things have gotten lost. And sometimes people just don't know how to conversate. And men want to have better conversations with other men. And what I mean by that is we're sick and tired of talking about those same five things. You know, everything's good, everything's fine, work, kids, current events. Yeah. But men are five dimensional. We have five dimensions. We have our financial being, our health, which encompasses physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, what we do for a living, which gives us validation and significance, relationship with our wife and our relationship with our kids. And men want to have better conversations when it comes to those five areas, but we don't want to be the, we don't want to be the one to ask, you know, for help or guidance or have those conversations. Like if I, if I went up to a guy, and this is where I, where, this is what I mean by the skill set. Men don't know how to have these conversations. And I was no stranger to that myself. I, I didn't know how to have these conversations. You can't go up to another man and say, Hey dude, let's have coffee. I need to talk to you about my feelings. It doesn't happen. You know, and if it did, it feels weird. It feels awkward. And it feels weird for me. If I were to ask that I'd feel weird for the other guy. Now, however, if I were the skill set that I'm talking about is you have to know how to set that conversation up for success. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I were to go to you and say, 
Hey, Klaus, you know, it seems like you really have your physical health in check and I'm struggling with that. And I was wondering if I buy you a cup of coffee, man, do you mind if we sit down and I just ask you a few questions about how you, how you get to the gym, how you eat right, how you just, I want to get better at this. Like, and you would probably, instead of me saying, Hey, I want to talk to you about how depressed I am about my weight and I don't feel good naked in front of my wife. You'd be like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, I'm, that sounds weird to me. But what I did in that conversation is I, I complimented you as like, I view you as someone who takes care of your health. I was wondering if you could give me advice, which by the way, is another compliment because men love to do that. We love to give advice. We love to problem solve and we love to be significant in someone else's journey to help mentor that person. So I, I really learned how to have those better conversations with people and men in particular, and that's made all the difference. And I would say that's what that that's how you can take a man who's broken in one or two or three of those dimensions and give him a band of brothers or give him someone or connect him with someone who can help him in those areas. Well, wow. yeah, that's that's useful. But um, that though yeah, help any man out there to to instead of hold everything in. And yeah, you're right. You don't want to come and oh, I want to talk about my feelings, because you know how men react then to other men even though they like to do it as well but giving compliments that that's that's an easy way to uh, to try and connect that way and make somebody feel good that that's brilliant thanks hey sorry for the interruption i know you're really enjoying the show just want to make sure if you're liking this information please subscribe and um, press the like button and also go visit becomeafearlessfather.com you get the opportunity to share your biggest challenge at the moment as a father and it gives me the opportunity to try and help you overcome this. Thanks and enjoy the rest of the show. So going a little bit into that, because of course you, you come from um, struggle. Um, however, the, what I see around me is that most fathers live an average life. They had an average um, childhood. Hell, like it was fun, it was happy, there was nothing really... And, and now they, you can see they have an average life, a normal life, right? So there's, no, there's nothing really pressing going on. And um, what I found interesting, for example, in your book is that you mentioned that, um, you know, we kind of starting to surpass the, the average father. Huh? The father works, puts the food on the table, you know, that, that, that's vanishing. And... Um, However, what I see is that most people now, they kind of just wobble along. They don't, they don't really see that urge to make a change. What is it that you think these fathers could or maybe even should do starting tomorrow that could really um, get, you know, like a snowball, get the ball rolling and get them to open their mind and see that there, there is more than just going with the flow. So I, I'm going to quote Stephen Covey. So I'll give you a couple of different things you can do. I'm going to quote Stephen Covey, who was the author of seven habits of highly effective people. Mm -hmm. You have to begin with the end in mind. Most men, most of us guys, we are so in the daily grind that we are oblivious to where the time is going. And that's really powerful. One of the exercises that we put men through is writing their own obituaries. Now that sounds morbid. That sounds scary. It's not. Think about that for a minute. Most men will go to their graves without ever understanding what the true vision of their life really was. Did, did you ever hear what happened? Uh, oh, I can't remember. Was it the Nobel Prize guy? Oh God, I can't remember his first name. Is it Alfred? Maybe, I don't know. I'm butchering this first name. But do you know the story about the man who, who developed the Nobel Prize? No. Okay, so he had a brother uh, who passed away. And in the newspaper, I guess it was that week that he passed away, his obituary was written. Well, the newspaper reporters had, him, had his brother confused with, I think it's Alfred, Alfred Noble, I'm pretty sure, mm -hmm. uh, who developed the Nobel Prize. They missed mistaken him for Alfred Noble. So his obituary was written, the man who is still living and not his brother. And he read his own obituary. And it was such 
an incredible wake up call for like, oh my gosh, like this is awful. This is the life I'm living. This is the impact I'm having on people. Like this is what I am. And it was such a huge wake up call that he completely made a pivot in his life and started living his life completely different. And now we have the Nobel prize. So it's, it's totally different. Now I will say this. I don't know the full scope of that story. I just know that that was the premise, but most men will go to their grave, not really understanding what the vision is for their life. The other thing most men don't understand is what are our core values? This is another exercise we 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 want men to do when they come and join us in the alliance. What's what's the core value exercise? So let me let me give you an example. Just about every human being operates within five to seven core values. Okay, and core values it's there's there's over thirty of them, but um, adventure is one, uh, uh, humor is one. Uh, what are some other ones? I am I'm totally uh, relationships is one. Uh, connection is one. So it's like all these different things and there it's all the core values is always one word. So we have a document that we, we allow men to understand what their core values are. Now you've probably, your subconscious knows what your core values are, but on a conscious level, we never really understand what our core values are. So I'm sure you've been operating in your life and you've come across a situation. You're like, I don't know what, maybe it's a girl you've dated, right? Maybe it's a girl you're dating at the time and you're like, I don't know what it is about this girl, but it doesn't feel right. I don't know what it is. It just doesn't feel right. That's our core values that are speaking to us. That's our, that's our um, intuition that's, that's speaking to us. Probably that girl that you're dating is not in line with your core values. Maybe one of your core values is adventure and she's like a homebody and she hates going out. And you're like, this doesn't feel right to me. Like I want to go out and explore. I want to travel. I want to do things. That's one example. And then there are times in your life where maybe you're dating the right person and you're like, I don't know what it is about this girl, but man, everything feels right. Chances are you're both operating within you. She's you and her are similar in core values. It feels right. It feels like a match. Same thing with our job. Same thing with even our emotions towards money. You know, like some of us are squirrels. We have to save every penny and some of us are spenders because we want to do it, but that's part of our core values. So most men don't really understand what their core values are. We just, we just have these gut feelings. Now, what, the thing that we put men through is we really allow them to understand what their five to seven core values are. And then, then they write what's called a being statement. And a being statement is it's like a life mission statement. And the way you use this in your life is anytime you are faced with a really tough decision, you can't figure out what to do. You go back to that being statement, those core values and say, does this next decision, does this next decision line up with my core values? So like, I'll, I'll give you one more quick example. Uh, environment is one of my core values. In other words, my environment means the world to me as far as my, uh, my attitude, my productivity, my happiness, all these things. So like the home that I live in has to feel very, very good to me. So we just moved literally this past weekend. And the home that we, we bought was a little bit more expensive than the home that we were in. But it was every single thing that my wife and my family wanted as far as within a home. It was bright. It had sunshine. It had all these things, you know, and it overlooked uh, a lake with a fountain. It was just very peaceful. And even though it was more expensive, it lined up with our core values of how our environment is so important to us. And it made that decision very easy. So we were like, well, should we do it? Should we pay more? It feels like we should. I don't really know. We were like, wait a second, this is in line with our core values. Our environment means a ton to us. It means a ton to our happiness. It means a ton to our family. We're going to do it. Most men don't understand that. And most people don't understand that. So that's another thing. Uh, and again, so getting back to your question, you really have to understand what you want your life to look like. What's the vision for your life? Because back to your question of men are just in the grind. You know, they're just, they're living these average lives because they don't know any better. Because most of us have never been taught to create a vision for our lives. No one has ever, has ever taught you to sit down and really understand what, is, what are my core values and what is my mission? What's my being? Why am I here? So that's what, that's what men, everybody should do that. If you did that, I guarantee, I think your life would, would operate very, very differently. Yeah, that's deep. And I hope people uh, listened well. Um, 
that that's something we work on with Niji a ton. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, there, there, there's one more thing I will share too. You have to get very real with yourself. Mm. You have you have to sit down and literally get very real with yourself. And what I mean by that is, look at those five dimensions: financial, your relationship with your wife, relationship with your kids, your your health, and what you do for a living. Those five things. Sit down and and write down. Am I where I want to be in each one of these things? And if not, where am I currently at? And why, why, why have I gotten here? And how do I get to the level that I want to get to? So maybe you're great with your finances, but your health is just a complete disaster. But you want, instead of going through like, oh, I'll just keep eating what I want and I'll just feel, you know, it just feels terrible, but I'm making good money. If you want to improve your health, this is where you get very real with yourself and be like, okay, you know what? I'm here. I'm at this weight. I might even have some, maybe I have the start of a disease process because of how I've eaten, but here's how I can turn it around. But most of us don't sit down and be like, all right, I, I need to get real with myself. I have to get real and stop lying to myself that this is okay because it's not, you know, it, it's, and I'm not saying it's, it's not okay for you. I'm just saying if it doesn't feel right to you, it's not right. So you have to get real as well with where you're currently at, where you want to go. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Thank you for that, Larry. Um, wow, <laughs> I'm learning a ton. I'm loving it. Uh, thanks a lot. I really appreciate this. So, um, it's going to be the last question that relates to your book, but um, I think these like what was it like five sentences made like a huge impact, and I loved it. And I really would like to see you know, get, get to know a little bit of your, what, what, what is that you do? So I'll get right into it. So one of the things that you said was that a successful marriage is a two way street. Now that sounds okay. Yeah, we know that. Um, but of course, that's what you also say is like, everybody says it's 50, 50. And then you mentioned straight and then just came in just to whack. It's like, no, you um, if you want your marriage to work, and you want to have the strength for the tough times ahead, it must be 100, 100, and not 50, 50. I was like, wow, that, that's so, that, so true. So can you explain um, this philosophy that you have a bit more, and especially what are some of your 100% efforts that you do that stand out and that you can see that are different from how most men go into the 50, 50 relationship? So in order for a marriage to work, it has to be a hundred, hundred. No one can be, no one can have one toe in the pool and then the other foot standing outside the pool. You got to dive in both feet. Both of you do. The, the thing that you have to keep in mind though, is you have zero control over what that woman does or says or anything in, in she, she is her own person, right? The difference is, is that you have to be committed, right? Both of you have to be committed. What I mean by this, so you have to, one of the things that my wife and I do, and we had to learn this the hard way, is different people have different love languages, okay? And so how I receive love is very different from how my wife receives love, and maybe how you receive love is differently from how I do. So what most people do is they will love their spouse in their own love language. This is another thing about awareness. Same thing with the core values. Most of us will go to our grave and we have no clue what our love language is. And Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. And they are physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time, uh, acts of service, and gifts. So different people receive love differently. I can tell you for the most part, you, you need to go to, if you're a man, you need to go take this test. And if you're a woman, you need to go take this test. And if you're a man taking this test, you need to send this test to your wife. And then if you're a wife, you need to share You need to send this test to your husband and just Google love languages test. It'll come right up. After you've taken that test, it's a lot like your core value. And the test takes like, takes like seven minutes. It's very easy. After you've taken that test, you'll have a lot of aha moments, just like in the core values exercise, just like in the um, obituary exercise. You'd be like, oh, no wonder. Like, no wonder when my wife kisses me, like I just feel like on top of the world. No wonder when my wife compliments me, I just feel like I'm on top of the world. And your wife will be like, well, God, no, no wonder when he empties the dishwasher for me, I feel so good. Or like when we go out on a date and he's not on his phone, 
like I feel so amazing. Or like if you get a gift, like a sentimental gift, like a bracelet with your kids initials in it, you feel on top of the world because you're like, Oh my gosh, that was just an amazing gift. I'm always going to have it, but we don't understand that how this shows up disaster disastrously in our, in our marriages. So I am a physical touch and words of affirmation, you know, touch me, kiss me. I want to have sex, all that good stuff. Just like a typical guy. Also words of affirmation. And I didn't really understand this until I had John Eldridge, who's the author of wild at heart on my show. Uh, the, the main need, the foundational need of every man is validation. Mm. It's validation, validate. We want to know that we are doing a good job. We want to know that we are valued. We want to know that we are appreciated. We want to know that we are respected. It helps us feel masculine, masculine, uh, Bradley Cooper, who played, uh, Chris Kyle, an American sniper. He's, you know, he's a huge American actor. Um, he was interviewed because he's probably one of the, you know, and I'm, he was voted one of the most attractive men in the world, I think at one point. And they did, People Magazine did an interview with him. And he's, I think at the time he was either married or he was committed to a girl, I can't remember what. But one of the questions was, you must get hit on just constantly by women, you know, just throwing themselves at you. How do you stay faithful? Because he's a faithful guy from what I understand. And his, his response was so profound and it speaks to all men. And he, he, he right away without hesitating, she makes me feel like I'm her man. And that's, that's what my wife does for me. She makes me feel like I am her man. And there is no better feeling than that. She, she respects me. She appreciates me. And she's not afraid to tell me those things. It, it feels very good. Now, if for all the women who are listening, and I'll get to the men, don't worry, but a good way to completely castrate your man and demasculate your man is to put him down and to take appreciation and respect away from him, to call him names. Uh, all these things will literally, it's, it's like shooting a man in the leg and then he falls down and then kicking him in the face. That's what it feels like. Now on the flip side, if you're a man who puts his feet up and the, and your belief is the woman should do everything and all you do is make the money, your woman is going to feel the exact same way. She's going to feel used. She's going to feel like she is the slave of the home and that's not the way women want to feel. So how this can show up disasterly in, in our relationship and how it did, I'm a physical touch and words of affirmation. So I had no problem with kissing my wife, hugging my wife when she was doing the dishes, coming up behind her and put my hands on her hips and kissing her neck and all that good stuff. And then of course I was very complimentary. Oh, you look so beautiful. You're so this, you're so that I just pouring compliments in her constantly. And I always would wonder like, why is that like always my go-to? I just don't understand that. Like my wife on the other hand is quality time and acts of service. So all the while when I'm doing the physical thing, she's like, gosh, bless you. I'm a house of four boys. It's just another male figure that wants something from me, you know, or like, you know, you haven't even done anything to help me out. Like, why do you want sex? Like, I don't even feel like I'm, I'm, I'm loved right now. And I just didn't understand that. I'm like, but I'm loving you, but I'm, look, I'm loving you. It's not the way she received it. Words of affirmation. Of course she loved to be complimented, but that's not what did it for her. Now on the flip side, she would love me through acts of service. So doing things for me, doing things for our family, laundry, all these other things and quality time. So when we were one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and I, I love spending time with her as well, but it didn't speak volumes to me like the other two did. So we, it was almost like she was speaking Chinese and I was speaking Swedish. You know, it's like we were speaking two different languages. Once we both read that book and really understood like, oh, this is the way I need to be loved. And this is the way I need to be loved now. Uh, I help out way more around the house, you know, so like dishes and dinners and I make her breakfast and I'll may bring her her coffee in the morning. When we go out on date nights, I put my phone away because I also found out the hard way that if I have my phone out and she's talking to me, it's just as impactful as if I were to make a sexual advance towards her and she physically pushed me away. It's so insulting and it hurts her feelings. Like I'm not like, I'm not important enough. Like, your Facebook up status update is more important than me wanting to talk to you about our family. So like, you know, she would just, and just in a very genuine way, she's like, that's kind of what it feels like. It hurts. I'm like, wow. Okay. I need to change that. And then, so now my wife knows, like, I love to be complimented. I love to be appreciated. So she, she does those things. 
And as far as physical, we have a great physical intimate relationship because she knows that's the way I need to, even, even the way, even the way she wakes me up in the morning, she, she literally, like I always sleep on my side or on my stomach and she'll take both of her hands and either rub my arm, like just in a really loving way, or just rub my back. And I'm just like, Oh my God, that's like the best way in the world to wake up. You know, especially if your love language is physical touch, it's like this awesome loving wave that for your wife to wake you up. And, um, so it's just a way of understanding. Now I will say this, it doesn't come naturally to me to do acts of service because I want to be physical with her. That's my default. And same with her. She had, she, she didn't grow up in a family that complimented a lot. So she always has to be like, okay, if I'm thinking he looks good, you know, in that shirt or whatever else I should tell him. And she always tells me, she's like, well, I always think that stuff. I'm just not good at telling you that stuff. And I was like, well, it makes him feel love when you tell me. So it's just understanding. So it literally, that book and that understanding will probably would probably save half the marriages in the world. I mean, I'm not kidding because you're speaking each other's language. Wow. That was, yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Um, I actually um, read that book. Um, I read the part for the kids, <laughs> but then it also has a chapter for, uh, um, for, for your, for your, uh, for your spouse, for your counterpart. Um, and yeah, it's deep. So yeah. I, I, wow, you, you're telling this story. I'm like, am I listening to myself or <laughs> absolutely brilliant. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I, I hope people are listening. I will put the link on how to get that book because I, uh, it's definitely recommendable to, uh, to every father and husband or person in general out there. Um, so again, thanks. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, uh, I appreciate, I appreciate you saying it was brilliant. It's, it's not my stuff though. I'm just, you know, I just oh. learned some, some good things from Gary Chapman. So yeah, no, no, absolutely. But it's your personal story as well. That makes it come yeah. alive and, and makes oh, at least me understand really well and feel connected with you and saying like, yeah, that's exactly the way it happens here <laughs> and yeah. the way we're working on it now. And, yeah, that's brilliant. I'm actually going to show this part to my wife so we can we can lay in this uh, story. Brilliant. Nice. So, um, yeah, I'm a little lost now. <laughs> <laughs> You're good, man. You're good. It's not about right. perfection, right? Yeah, no, no, no. True, true, true. Um, so, um, as, as, as you um, obviously know, um, our, our kids, they model us, they copy us, and, you know, straight from the beginning, how young they are. Sometimes, um, you know, I believe we are the biggest role model, if, if not even their heroes, right? So right. If, if, if you think about that, that that's a huge responsibility. Um, so so what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that, on, on, you know, that responsibility of, of actually being like the biggest, their biggest role model, taking on that responsibility? And do you have like maybe systems in place that you use to make sure that, you you or guarantee is maybe a hard word but that that you can always remember like okay yeah i am the biggest role model and that's what i want to be that's you know i'm setting those high standards for myself as i know i am i want to be that person for them yeah that's a good question so the way i i can't remember what podcast guest uh gave me this example but it really stuck with me uh, which is you have to be the character in your own movie. You have to think of your life as a movie that your kids are watching nonstop. Now I'll take that a step further with my own interpretation. So I've thought about that. I've done that. And I'm like, I was like, you know, sometimes the character in my movie really is good and on point and had good moments. And then there are some times where this character just sucked. <laughs> right. You know, And so sometimes I'm like, am I the hero or the villain? Right. And unfortunately, you know, I have a lot of villain days. You know, I have, even though I run this community and this podcast, like I always joke that, yeah, I'm, I'm the president and the founder, but I'm the first guy in line as a client because man, it's never perfect. You know, it's never perfect. It's messy. It is messy. There isn't a week that goes by that I don't apologize to my kids for something like me acting like a child, like a, a big idiot, you know, at times. So my kids, you know, they watch my every move you know, they watch how I respond to them. And then I see 
little bits of me show up in them. And sometimes it's so pleasant and sometimes it's so scary, right? I have a temper just like any other guy, but how this shows up in my life is my, uh, here's an example. My 12 year old, I'll, I'll talk, I'll talk about the good first and then the bad. My 12 year old is a very empathetic person. It amazes me how well he can read people, but I can read people really well. I'm a very empathetic person. When someone shares a story with me, I can feel those feelings. Like when, when someone shares how distressed they are and they're crying, I almost want to cry with them because I can feel it. I understand it. And my, my 12 year old is the same way. He can tell just by your body language, what you're, what's going through your head. He, I'll walk into a room and be like, you okay? You look like you're having a bad day. And I'm like, dude, you're 12. Like, yeah, you know, but I can do that too. Now at the same token. And then, so like, and my 10 year old probably has like my relentless work ethic. And I don't say that to be egotistical. Like I, I'm relentless to probably my own demise. Like I could, I could literally work for 23 hours out of the day and just keep, just keep going. You know, uh, we just moved this past weekend and the first I was wearing my Fitbit the first day that we moved, I walked over 40,000 steps, which was just shy of 18 miles. And then the second day I did 22,000 miles, which was just shy of 10. So I basically in a day and a half ran a marathon and I just kept going and going and going and going. And my wife was like, God bless. Will you take a break? I was like, I want it done. I want it done. And my 10 year old, he is a no quit. He will die before he stops, you know? So that's, that's the good thing, right? Here's where it shows up poorly though. <laughs> my four-year-old is like a chatterbox. He's just like any other four-year-old. And sometimes when you're trying to get out just one sentence to your wife or your kids or have, it's like, dad, 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 dad. And you're like, Lawson, for the love of God, please be quiet. I am trying to say something, you know, you just can't get it out. Well, I noticed my 12-year-old, Lawson, for the love of God, would you stop talking? And I'm like, oh boy, there's me. You know what I mean? And then, and then, uh, you know, there, there are other things too that, uh, what are some other things? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not much of an excuse person at all, but sometimes I can get on my, like my temper tantrums. I don't want to do this because, you know, like even, even though I'll do it, you know, like I, cause I'll, I'll, I'll be like, man, I'm really don't want to shuffle the driveway, man, right now. It's really cold. I'm not in the mood. I'd rather just stay inside, but I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm complaining about it and that will show up. I don't really want to do it. It's, it's, it's cold outside and it's warm in here and I'll do it later. You know? So I could see that procrastination, that complaining show up. And I'm like, I need to be better with that. Cause that's where it's showing up. So yeah, I, I try to, be, I try to be that hero, but every day, it's like uh, two face, you know, from the movie Batman, or it's like the incredible Hulk. Maybe that's a better one, you know, without the green and the muscles, you know, where you're either Bruce Banner or you're the Hulk, even though they're both heroes, but both have completely different personalities and you are the star in your own movie. Your kids will emulate you the good and the bad, and you will see little snippets of you all day long. And the cool thing about it is, is when you see that, be like, here's some things, here, here are some things I've done lately. Like, if my 10, 12 year old talks to my four year old, like, I'm like, you know what? You shouldn't talk to him like that. And you know what? I shouldn't either. I know you're hearing that from me. So maybe I should be the first to not do those things. And maybe you could do the same. So it's teaching them ownership as well. Mm. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I want to skip. We're getting close to eight o'clock. Um, and I want to keep you too long, of course. Um, so for my last two questions, they're, they're a little related. They're, th they're things um, I'm kind of struggling with at the moment. And if I read it correctly in your book, you studied health management, correct? I did. Excellent. So maybe you can, you can help uh, me and other fathers out there a little bit with this. Um, do you have a system in place to help your kids or to, to, to raise your kids in a healthy um, lifestyle, you know, to make sure that they eat well, exercising, of course, is important, sleeping well, et cetera, et cetera. I can't say they always eat well. 
uh, which I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit that I, my wife and I eat well, uh, you know, sometimes our kids can be really picky and that's not an excuse. Uh, we should, we should give them limited choices on meals and make them as healthy as possible. Now I will say this, so they eat mac and cheese and chicken nuggets and all that good stuff. I mean, just like any other kid, one thing we try to do more of though, is we try to do more smoothies. And in those smoothies, I'll pack in like almond milk and uh, greens and uh, blueberries, fresh fruit, all kinds of different things to just really give them a powerhouse of antioxidants. So basically making healthy food taste better in a fun smoothie. That's what's helped us. Um, you know, and as far as uh, that, that would be my, my, I'm not always, we're not always good at dinners, especially yeah. uh, at dinners. They have a lot of kid food breakfast. We try to make it somewhat healthy with smoothies. Lunchtime is somewhat healthy, but then dinner, we, you know, we try to get, you know, they do eat salads and they're, they are required to eat a fruit and a vegetable at dinner before they can have a dessert. So they have to do that. Their protein sources may, may not be the best, but they are required. They have to eat fruit or vegetable and a vegetable and, or, uh, and as far as, uh, physical fitness, we're a very active family. We have, uh, we have our gym in our garage and in the summertime, we all, we do family workouts. You know, we have kettlebells and squat racks and all kinds. And we, we work out as a family together. Uh, and that I think, and our kids are fit. They really are fit. My 10 year old just won the fittest kid in his school. You know, he beat out sixth graders for push-ups and how fast he ran a mile and all like, and I, and I like to think that he's learned some things because that's, that's the way we operate as a family, strong body, strong mind, you know, and, and we work out, which, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, you can't, you can't, a 10 year old can't work out. You know, a 12 year old can't work out. That is absolute crap. It is way more unhealthy to have your child sitting in front of the TV playing PlayStation for four hours. They can go out and they can, and I'm not talking about 12 year olds and 10 year olds doing power cleans and back squats. And like, I'm talking about like, Hey, let's go out and do some pushups. Like, let's go out and do some jumping jacks. Let's go out and jump rope. Let's go out and swing some kettlebells. I'll grab the 50, you grab the 10, you know, and let, let's race down to the street and back. Let's do it five times. You know, these, these fun workouts where the kids are smiling, we're making it into a game. They're not doing anything that's going to hurt themselves. And it's a way to bond as a family. And the cool thing is when we're done with our, with our workout, Hey, let's sit down and let's make a recovery smoothie and you know, everybody cheers to a, to a really good workout. Nice. I'm loving the smoothie idea. So um, I'm going to ask you for some recipes later. That sounds like a brilliant idea. And, and the, the workout it's, it's because talking about, there's no information out there for fathers. I've been trying hard to find information on, on healthy eating for kids and, on, on exercises for kids and it's it's difficult to to find something now i'm talking about the the age for my kids so one is two and one is five so maybe the two is a little bit too young although i think i found one really cool one that they love is with animals so they do the animal movements and stuff like that they love that um, but that's it and the other one's five so he's starting a little bit with karate and and, and with push-ups and stuff like that so that's okay but it's difficult so i really appreciate your uh, your input on that um, and, and, and I'm glad to hear that you really work on that as a family. So something we're going to implement a little bit more. So great. Thanks for that. So related to the topic of health, right? Because I'm really focused on this and I find it really important. And I hope more and more fathers are, are going into the same direction. Now, here's where I struggle even more. Uh, as I told you, it's really hot here. The sun is coming out and, and my kids, thank God, they want to go to the playground and play with their friends, which I find amazing because what you mentioned also is kind of a standard, no kids sitting in front of the TV, playing their PlayStation or watching for like four hours straight and not doing anything. And so I want them to go out there. Now here comes my challenge. I want my kids to eat healthy as much as they can. I'm not going to say they don't eat candy because they do. Um, we're not saints. <laughs> However, their parents out there go to the park every single day and they um, bring candy, chips, and all kinds of stuff every single day, which means that my kids will be surrounding them and 
the good thing is they are a kid's share, so that's great. But that means that my kids will be eating that crap every single day too, and that kind of frustrates me. And I have no idea how to respond to that or just let it go. So I was wondering what your thought is on that. So you're a man with two kids and I'm a man with four. So maybe my tolerance is a bit higher, you know, because there, there are certain, because if I, if I battle on everything, I'll be battling all the time. Right. Uh, my view of it is, you know, sleepovers, birthdays, going to the park for a picnic, you know, you just hanging out with your friends. Like, yeah, you know, let, let them be kids, you know, let them be kids when they're in your house and they're having breakfast and dinner, you know, then it's like, Hey, you know, like, um, before you grab, uh, a piece of chocolate for dessert, uh, have an apple or have broccoli, you know, luckily my, like my 10 year old, he loves broccoli. He will choose broccoli over French fries, which blows my mind. And I try not to make a big deal of it when he does it because I'm like, Oh my God, do I say anything? Like, like he's just doing it on his own. I just let him do it, you know? And then same thing. He'll, he'll choose a fruit cup over French fries, which is I'm like, man, that's awesome. Uh, now the, if he's at a birthday party and there's pizza, man, eat pizza. If you're at a park and all these kids are eating suckers, eat suckers, you know, just, you know, it's like, you, you just let them be kids. But when we're all as a family, like the, the rules are different. You know, we're not on a playground. You're not with your friends. Like we're going to enjoy, you can have something that's not healthy during dinner, but you have to have a fruit or a vegetable. And we prefer, we prefer clean protein sources as well, but they're not always going to do that. And, you know, it, it just, it makes dinners more enjoyable as long as I can sneak in like high potency, healthy foods in their body here and there, but still allow them to be a kid. Then I think you've won. I mean, because I think even as a, as a healthy adult, you know, uh, my wife and I, you know, we eat right, but we allow ourselves two two to three cheap meals a week. You know, we follow the 80, 20 rule. You know, if we want to go out and have dessert and we're having dinner one night, we're going to eat dessert. You know, if we want to have pizza with our kids on Friday night, you know, and it's the worst pizza for you ever, we're going to have pizza with the kids. You know, it's, it's just, you got to have the balance. Exactly. I, I love what you said about, um, you don't have to battle every single uh, fight. You don't have to battle every single right. issue that comes up. That's, um, I want to put that in my mind and work on that and not worry about it. Brilliant. That, that's going to help me out a lot. Thanks. Thanks for that, Larry. I really appreciate that. So yeah. Um, eight o'clock, as I said, I don't want to keep you too long. I really appreciate this, Larry. It was really educational, a wonderful and fun interview. <laughs> we left on. So I really want to uh, thank you for that. Now, just in case if there's people out there that want to connect with you, um, that have even some more questions, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate that. So I, I answer every single email that I get. Uh, so you can always email me at Larry at good project, uh, dot com. Uh, as far as, uh, everything that I do is a good dad project.com. That's where the podcast is. If you want more information on, uh, the Alliance and what we do there, that's our elite brotherhood. There's, there's a tab in there for that too. You can go to good dad project.com forward slash Alliance. If you want to check out what we do, uh, as far as, but yeah, you can just send me an email. You can find me on Facebook. I'm not too picky about who I uh, connect with on Facebook. Uh, women, I don't really, I don't really accept friendships from women too much. Um, especially I, women I know, of course, but not women I don't know. I usually just delete those. Uh, but men, usually, as long as you don't look like a complete psycho, or you know you're you're part of ISIS, then I <laughs> I usually accept any and all friendships. Uh, so yeah. And then we have a big group on Facebook, uh, called the dad edge group. If you just search dad edge group, real dads with purpose, there's two different dad edge groups. There's dad edge Alliance, which that's our membership community. Uh, we don't allow just anyone in there. That's our membership platform. Uh, the dad edge, real dad, real dads with purpose. If you want to follow us on social media and have better conversations with men, cause we use that as a way to have better conversations with men. Cause we talk about those five dimensions constantly. So that's where you can find me. Nice. Excellent. And, and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to uh, make, make a little um, recommendation to other fathers out there because this is your, your book. I got this. And um, I, I, told, I think I wrote you about it. And I just want to tell everybody, I, every father out there, my kid's five. Um, I live in Spain, so they, they speak Spanish, but we also work uh, sometimes 
either two days a week or four days a week, a complete days of English. So I, I read this bedtime story. And man, the first time I read this story, the response from my oldest son was absolutely, wow, out of this world, heartwarming. And he hugged me, he kissed me, he, he got really, like it felt like we connected just by reading this bedtime story. So I, I really want to appreciate it. Thank you for this. Um, and I want to recommend this to every single father out there to get this book and read, read this at least once, at least once time, one time a week for their, for the, for their children. Oh, thank so, you, man. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, not, not to cut you off, but I, I do have a funny story behind the book. So, uh, my, my 10 year old, he's the one who's kind of relentless, right? And he he'll push you to do things. And he, I was reading him, uh, I think it was, I will always love you, which is a story about a mother who loves her son, you know, uh-huh. there's a big story about it. It's a classic. It's been around forever. So I used to read that to my, to my kids and they're like, why are you reading us a mom book? And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's, it's, I feel the same way that the mom does in this book. There's no dad books out there. And, uh, my 10 year old looked at me, he punched me in the arm and he goes, why don't you write one then you've already written one. Why don't you write one? And I'm like, it's a good point. Like, okay, now I got to do it. Now I'm committed. But I I wrote that book, not only for kids, I wrote it more for the fathers, believe it or not. I wrote it more because the things in that book were the things that a father really, really feels, but have a very hard time saying because it doesn't come to mind usually, or if it does, we don't want to come across as soft and not the book, then the book will not, it will not make you look soft. It makes you look actually really strong because it's, that's the thing is, is you always love and protect. Right. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an emotional book for dads too. I mean, uh, because it, it does illustrate that love for that kid and the kid really feels it when they're being read to. And plus it's bears. Who doesn't like bears? If you're a kid, every kid likes bears, right? Exactly, exactly. Well, as I said, I really appreciate this book. Um, it, it, uh, yeah, it's we're reading it twice a uh, twice a week. My kids love it. They they ask for it now, which is which is cool. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm very happy with this uh, with this book, and it's helping us out a lot. So thank you for that. So oh, Larry, yeah. thanks again. Um, let's let's stay in touch. Um, I, I missed like three questions that I said. I had tons of questions more. So who knows in the future? Uh, it will be an honor for me. And definitely um, for now and to everybody out there, I hope you learned just as much as I did. And um, hopefully we'll see each other in the next live interview. That sounds great. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Are you still meeting up with your friends now that you're a father? Kids making you stress out. You got no time for yourself to work out, read, relax. Can you still remember the time you were hanging out with your friends, feeling energetic, happy and confident, spending time together and talking about your life and your crazy dreams? You're feeling alone now, don't you? No one to share your challenges with and you're just running around from one storm into the next. Well, it's time to change this now. Join me and the Brotherhood of Fearless Fathers to speak on a weekly basis with like-minded dads to crush your challenges, face your fears with determination, be held accountable and regain control of your life. If you want to become the hero your family needs you to be, then go to becomeafearlessfather.com slash brotherhood. Looking forward to seeing you on one of our next calls.